These patients um, are high-risk patients. So they're not essentially complicated. These are patients who have presented with acute dissection, and now they're in a, a category where if you leave them, they're more likely to progress. And so these are patients, for example, who have resistant hypertension, have big entry tears, partial false lumen thrombosis, or ongoing tissue inflammation, which I'm not going to talk much about, big aortas, and a big false lumen. So these are the kinds of things that you need to think about when you're looking at a CT in a patient with an uncomplicated dissection who could potentially benefit from intervention. In terms of timing these patients, you're trying to push them out at least to two weeks post-event, if not six weeks. But the sweet spot of treating these patients is definitely in the first three months. Once you go beyond three months, the issue then becomes whether or not you're going to get the aorta to remodel. So, you know, if you look at the reason that we try and push them beyond two weeks is just to keep their complication rates down. So risk of paraplegia, risk of stroke, retrograde dissection, overall complication rate drops significantly beyond two weeks. So the only patients really that you're treating in that two week mark, like the one you saw in the previous talk, are patients who have ruptured, have malperfusion, uh, you know, probably, you know, impending rupture or patients you deem to be impending. And then the other patients are the ones who you treat beyond two weeks, the aortic expansion, big aortas, big false lumen, big fenestration, uh, you know, patients who represent with ongoing back pain, those are the ones you're trying to treat. So here's a good example of that. So this is a 62 year old who was sent to us a week post intervention, uh, sorry, a week post dissection um, from a peripheral hospital. And this was his initial CT when we first met him. Uh, and there's a number of things we're gonna go through on the CT, because as opposed to, uh, acute complicated dissection, you need to look at these more carefully in the sense of you're looking for high risk features. So you can see already when you look at this aorta that it's big, it looks dilated, but that in itself isn't good enough. There's gotta be a number of factors that you look at. So you can see here, I'm gonna show you a series of measurements and talk about them. So firstly, you can see here that the false lumen measures up to two and a half centimeters, which one is a poor prognosticator. A, a, a false lumen bigger than two centimeters is a problem. Uh, the next one is um, the fenestration size. So a fenestration bigger than one centimeter, this patient has a fenestration of 1.6 centimeters, that is a poor prognosticator. So it's something that you need to consider. So now we have two uh, negative prognosticators. We have a big false lumen and we have a big fenestration. So that's a problem. Then we look at the overall size of the aorta and you can see how the aorta measures about 4.3 centimeters, which is borderline. Anything bigger than four and a half centimeters for sure. But in our center, we tend to use four centimeters as a cutoff. So if your aorta is bigger than four centimeters, we're more likely to look at that together with a cluster of the other risk factors to determine whether to stent you or not. So again, you know, this is a patient with a seemingly uncomplicated dissection. Uh, but this is not an uncomplicated dissection at all. This is uh, an acute, oh, sorry, this is a complicated dissection in the sense of high risk features. So again, big um, false lumen, big fenestration, and overall aortic diameter, which is approaching a relatively large size. So if I just run through this quickly, I'm just going to show you the very proximal descending thoracic aorta. So you can see, uh, you can see the false lumen there is clearly big big fenestration and the aorta is getting on the big size, on the big side, should I say. Uh, this is the uh, abdominal aorta. And often in these patients, they don't have a huge abdominal aorta. Um, but what you need to be cognizant of is that maybe one or two or more uh, branch vessels may come off the false lumen or a combination of true and false. And so here the left renal artery comes off both true and false. So how do I size these patients? What do I think about? So in the subacute phase, because there is perfusion of the false lumen and because these patients are already now at least two weeks out, you can be more generous with the amount of aorta that you cover. So in an acute dissection, I tend to put in one covered stent. In subacute dissections, I tend to stent all the way down to the celiac axis. And the reason for that is to cover as much of the thoracic aorta as possible to promote false lumen thrombosis. I tend to still oversize 10%. I try not to go much more than that and then uh, a dissection stents down to the bifurcation. Whether or not to revascularize a subclavian, we do it in every case. 
um, the jury's out, some people revascularize, some people don't, but I think it's a good idea if you, if it's an elective case and you have time to revascularize and decrease your risk of spinal cord ischemia. So generally I tend to oversize up to 10% in these subacute cases. I measure my distal landing zone in the true lumen and try not to oversize that too much. And then I use a tapered stent graft, at least one. So four millimeters, there are double tapered stent crafts on the market. I don't tend to use the double tapers. Uh, I would avoid telescoping as much as possible because your risk of a retrograde goes up and the barbs, whether you use barbs or not, I don't think makes a huge difference. So this is that case again, you can see here, this is a Cook Alpha stent graft. It has barbs, we use barbs a lot. This patient has had a, um, a subclavian transposition with uh, ligation of the stump of that subclavian artery. This is a single covered stent graft being deployed. You can see their flow in the false lumen and then this is post. Uh, it looks like there's very little anti-grade flow in the uh, false lumen and all good flow in the true lumen, but still that true lumen looks compromised. Um, and so this patient was then stented with dissection stents all the way down to the bifurcation. And so what I think about when I'm deploying this, I try and get a CTA as up to date as possible. If it's acute, I tend to get it early on. So within a few hours of the case, I always, I trust my CTA. I do my measuring of my CTA. I don't remeasure when I'm in the case, unless something major has happened. I place my Lundquist wire as close to the aortic valve as possible. And then I use IVUS at, at a minimum to make sure that I stay in the true lumen the whole way through the dissection because you can easily go from true lumen into false lumen without you even knowing. And so here again is that case, you can see um, a, a, a stent graft down to the mid descending thoracic aorta, extended down to the celiac axis and then dissection stents all the way down uh, to the bifurcation. And so, you know, good uh, initial result. Uh, just something to be cognizant of in patients who uh, come in with subacute dissection, there are some poor predictors of mortality in, in these patients. So even if they potentially don't have malperfusion, patients who are shocked, obviously, renal failure, a pleural effusion on admission, those are high-risk patients. And then be aware of patients with refractory hypertension. These patients have a very high mortality rate. So even if they're not malperfusing, if you can treat these patients in the subacute phase and get rid of the dissection and, and oppose the, uh, the true lumen to the wall of the aorta again and reestablish good um, active flow into the visceral vessels, hopefully that'll help with their, with their, with their um, hypertension. Uh, surgery obviously carries a very high mortality. So what do you do if you've stented these patients and there's residual flow in the false lumen? So if the true lumen is expanding, but the false lumen still has flow, you need to deal with it. And there's ways to deal with it. You can either do the stabilized technique where you essentially rupture the intima at the level of the celiac axis and essentially obliterate the false lumen. But you can only do this in aortas that are small enough that whatever size stent graft you've put in at the bottom will expand to the size of the aorta. You know, there's no point in, in um, rupturing the intima of an aortic dissection if your stent graft is too small because you're just gonna have rapid flow in that false lumen. So you can only do that in very specific cases. So what I do a lot of is what we call the after technique, which is essentially going into the false lumen, mapping it out and deploying coils, uh, liquid embolics, whatever you need to, to shut down the, uh, uh, the false luminal flow. So here's a, another case, this is again a subacute dissection who was, had high risk features for progression. You can see here, a fenestration bigger than one centimeter, uh, big false lumen, um, you know, a false lumen measured 3.3 centimeters, overall aorta 4.3 centimeters. Um, and so this patient was uh, treated uh, at the six week mark with, um, with a TVAR. And you can see here, he has the stent graft deployed. Uh, you can see that he's got good flow in his visceral vessels. We've stent him down to just above the aortic bifurcation. And then we did a follow-up CT, which showed some residual flow in the false lumen that had slightly unusual imaging characteristics. And this is where MRI plays such a major role. So you can see here, this is a time-resolved MR showing anti-grade flow and retrograde flow in the false lumen. So the, the issue with this is that there is anti-grade re-entry flow in the false lumen and it's probably due to a combination of the stent being slightly undersized. And in that, I mean, you know, we've sized it because it's a subacute dissection, not in the same way and with the same aggressive nature that we would if this was a, uh, you know, a chronic dissection or an aneurysm. So it's a little bit undersized. 
for the IFU, and also there's a, probably a short landing zone. Uh, this is a non-contrast uh, scan just to show you that you can acquire really good high quality images without using uh, contrast. And so you, you, the problem with this, these patients are that you can't just leave them, you need to do something. And so in these anti-grades, you can either extend the stain craft, but you can see, and you'll see in the next image, if you extended it, you wouldn't have, you, the chances are that because of the distance to the, to the uh, bovine trunk, it's unlikely that you would have gained much distance with that covered stent. Uh, and so, you know, again, it's a relatively invasive procedure to do. Whereas if you can do a percutaneous coil embolization like I've done here. So essentially I got into the false lumen. You can see on that uh, middle image, that the dissection extended into the proximal external iliac. I found that fenestration, got through it, got into the false lumen. Uh, and you can see I did a run there and you can see I'm actually refluxing contrast through the subclavian stump and into the uh, ascending aorta. Uh, and so what I did then was I, I got into that subclavian stump, uh, coiled it with micro coils, and then essentially just coiled backwards with a micro catheter. I used a coronary guide catheter just to give me some stability. And when you're dealing with false luminal embolization, I think it's good to have something rigid in that false lumen that will just give you support. And so I use coronary guide catheters a lot. You don't need a complex shape. I just use the multi-purpose here. And then I used a combination of 035 and 018 coils. And I generally tend to use hydrogel coils, the, the Taruma hydrogel coils, um, because I find they expand really well and they can actually fill a lot of space with few coils. So you can see my packing density in the, the distal packing coils is, is not very high. And that's because you've got to understand that these coils have gel on them and they will expand and you don't actually see the gel. So here you can see some very slow flow. And then I did an ascending aortogram and it completely thrombosed that, uh, that false lumen. So this is a really good result. Percutaneous procedure, patient comes in, groin puncture, and there you can see the, uh, the remaining abdominal aorta, which looks really good. Um, there's some residual flow in the false lumen in the abdominal aorta, but it's not big, and I would not go after that with anything elaborate. But the important thing is that actually, even with just coiling the proximal false lumen, the retrograde flow is much, much slower, and the likelihood is that the entire length of that thoracic aorta will thrombose over a month or two. And there you can see uh, flow into the visceral vessels. And so with persistent false luminal flow, you must go as proximal as you need to. So don't just treat at the diaphragmatic hiatus. Um, proximal perfusion will have intercostal vessels that you need to treat, at least coil across them. And the problem is the longer that you leave these patients, the more that you're going to land up having to treat. And remember that some false lumen will uh, resolve with time. So you have to kind of find a balance. Uh, and just quickly, this is just the, uh, our approach to complicated type B dissection in terms of how we plan these patients, how we treat them. Uh, you, can, you can refer back to this at, at any time. And this is our subacute dissection approach. In other words, you know, patients with uncomplicated type B dissection who are treated at the you know, six week mark or, or three month mark, this is how we kind of sequence them. So all of them get subclavian revascularization and the petticoat technique. So again, look for high risk features of progression, um, aim for six weeks post, don't oversize too much. And then you need to follow these patients up with one, three, six and 12 month scans initially. Um, but it's really good to have a good robust program in place to follow these patients up. Thank you. Um.